Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together and let's sing. Never stop. 
Father, we just thank you so much for this day, and we know, Father, that you're in our midst and you're working. We may not see it. And Lord, later in the service, when we sing about those mountains that are in our lives that just don't seem to get out of the way when we pray, Lord, we know you're working in our lives. And we know you make a way. You made the way for our salvation when you sent your son to go to the cross and die for our sin and and Father, we believe and we confess that Jesus is Lord today. Be with us in this service and give us a great day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a seat for a moment just so that you can sit down and then stand right back up in just a minute when we turn around and greet each other, right? But if you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. We're glad you chose to be here at Hepzibah today. And if you're visiting for the first time or first time in a long time, there's some connection cards in the pews in front of you. Just take one of those and fill it out. At the end of the service, the offering boxes are in the hallways. And along with your check, you can drop that in those boxes as well. But that, let that be your uh, attendance today, just so that we get to know you or pray along with you. When you have those things in your life, when you don't see God working, and you need someone to pray with you, the staff is glad to pray alongside you for whatever's going on in your life. Pray that you'll receive a blessing today, just knowing that God is in the midst and He's working in our lives each and every day. Amen. Let's stand together. Guys are going to play, and um, we're going to turn around and greet each other, and then we're going to sing a little bit more. So if you will, just tell somebody you're glad to see them today.
beyond just a casual cultural version of Christianity that is presented in many churches today. The commitment that we are called to for Christ is so much deeper. The commitment that is called for us is us understanding what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news that you and I, by nature, are sinful human beings. And in our sin, we are separated eternally from God. That sin separates you and I, all of us, all of our difficulties in life, all of your anger and your depression, your loneliness, your frustration, so much more that is caused by this sinful nature. All of this can be boiled down to the fact that we, you and I, have a fractured relationship with our Creator. In our sinful nature, all of us try to find our satisfaction, all of us try to find our identity in something else other than God. So if you and I try to find our satisfaction in other things in life, you try to find your identity in what your work is, you try to find your identity in your kids or your spouse, if you try to find your identity in anything other than Jesus, you fall short. You and I, when we come to an understanding of what the gospel is, the good news that we are in our nature sinful against God, that God has come and made a way for you and I, despite our sin, he loved us in spite of our sin. And he sent his son to the earth to live a perfect life that you and I could not live, to die the death that you and I deserve to die, to pay the penalty for our sin. God has made a way for you and I. This is the good news of the gospel. 
And if you and I do not find our identity, if we do not find our satisfaction in who he is, we'd rather instead chase after the things of this world. You and I try to find our identity in other things. You will never find a spouse that completes you because that person is sinful as well. Your identity is not found in who the person is that you are married to or who the person is that you may get married to. Your satisfaction should not come from your job or your kid's school or your kid's grades or your kid's performance in games or sports. Your satisfaction should not come from you being a mom or a dad. Your satisfaction, your identity, I see it all the times at ball fields. You see parents get caught up in their performance of their own child's performance in a game. You're playing t-ball. Why are you mad? Why are you screaming? It's t-ball. Nobody knows what they're doing. Everybody's running around. Find your identity in your kid's performance. And all of a sudden, if we start doing this, your identity becomes your job. If we start doing this, your identity becomes your child or your spouse. If I am not careful, my identity will become Pastor Michael. It will become Father Michael, Husband Michael. Am I all of those things? Yes, my identity is found in Jesus, not any of those things. You see, if we find our identity in those things, they will not satisfy. We will always be left wanting more. Do I love my job? Absolutely. Do I love my child? Absolutely. Do I love my wife, my parents, or my friends, the people that are around me? Absolutely. Can my wife and my daughter give me a bad day? Sometimes. Especially lately when Lorelai has been uh, teething, uh, demon-possessed. I, I don't know what's been going on. Can't you put me in a bad mood and give me a headache? Yeah. Absolutely, but that's not where my ultimate satisfaction comes from. My satisfaction, my identity, my purpose belongs in Jesus. Because you see, Lorelai nor Amy can hold the weight of my expectations, my identity. They will always fall short. They will always be left wanting more. If you and I have not found that freedom that is found in knowing Christ, in committing your life to him, if you or I start chasing after other things, trying to find our satisfaction in things that should not bear the weight of our identity. We try to chase after drugs. We try to chase after women. We try to chase after the fantasies that were lived out online. We try to chase after jobs. We try to find our satisfaction in ball team performances. Whatever it is for all of us, if you chase after those things, they will never bear the weight of what Jesus only can bear. So if you are chasing after those things, if you are struggling to find out who your identity is, trust in Jesus. Commit to him. If you are here today and you've been trying to find your identity and your satisfaction in other things, I beg you to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here and you've come to church for a long time. You've just been drifting away, further and further away from what God has called you to. Trust in him. Because without a commitment to Christ, you cannot commit to the church. Without a commitment to Christ, you can't commit to the church and have a commitment, a community that is built around a church family. You can't have any of these things if you are constantly trying to wage war against the things in your life that will never satisfy. Trust in Jesus. This lays the foundation for us today as we look at the church and its community. See the relationship here. A commitment to Christ leads to a commitment to the local church. And a commitment to the local church leads to a commitment to each other, the people that are sitting in here, a community that is completely different than what the world has to offer. A relationship inside the local body of believers that is so unique. You see, the biblical word for community is koinonia. This word is first used in Acts chapter 2. After the church is born, a unique something is created. In an odd, brackish water while the church is being made, while they're in a synagogue system, but they're trying to figure out what this Jesus thing means. This word, a community, this koinonia is formed. The idea of this koinonia fellowship is the idea of being united in both purpose and service alongside one another to accomplish that goal, sharing the gospel. It is the thing that unites us is around the gospel. There are a ton of things, passages that we could look at that explain what this level of community is. But today we're going to look at Romans chapter 12. 
And there are five one another's. There are five one another's that lead us and build us to understand what this community in the church should look like. The first one is that we should belong to one another. We in the church belong to one another. We belong to each other in a way that is so unique and different than the world around us. Look with me in Romans chapter 12, starting in at verse 3. Read 3 through 5. Paul says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. As Christians, you and I belong to the body of Christ. We talked about this extensively last week. I won't go into a a ton of detail today because we talked about it so much last week. But what unites us is not our political parties. What unites us is not our economic status or our family history. Some of you met your spouse in a bar. I think half the church probably has met each other in a bar somehow. Praise God for redemption. Some of you, maybe, met your spouse in a church. Those two are not the same things. We are united in a community around each other. Some of you are still looking for that special someone. Some of you are just praying that you didn't ever meet that person. Some of you in here have stories of economic backgrounds, growing up in a broken home, Some of you have stories of growing up where two families, two parents loved you very much. Some of you are in here who have grandparents, loved ones, relatives that are going through things right now. Some of you have never experienced that. There are so many things that unite all of us. How can you take people who are from different economic backgrounds, different social statuses, we go to different schools, we attend different events, we don't play all the same sports together. All of these things could pull us away from each other, yet we are united around the gospel of Jesus here at this church. It's not like this church is made for people who met in a bar. It's not like this church is made for those who are X number of, you make X amount each year. We don't all attend because we all love deer hunting or turkey hunting. What unites us as a body of believers is the gospel. We come together as a body of Christ. It is a community that is unlike any other community. You don't have this kind of community at a ball game because everybody is there for the reason of ball. You don't have this kind of thing at a school system in the way that relates to one another the same way that the church does. This is the kind of community that God has called us to one that brings us from different areas, one that unites us all as one body here at the church. So we belong to one another. Second thing that we see this morning is that we are gifted for one another. We are gifted for one another. Look with me in verses 6 through 8. Paul says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Paul is saying here that each and every one of us have unique gifts that God has given to you. Gifts that are unique to you. That's what makes you a hand versus me a foot. Or makes you the stomach versus somebody else that is the ear. This is the examples that we looked at last week. When when God is talking about all of these things, all of us have different gifts. All of us have different abilities that God has given to you that is different from me. But what unites us as one body is the giftedness that God has given, that has been distributed in the church, that should be built up for the church's benefit. Now, I do not have the gift of singing, unless you consider singing like screaming goats. I, I just don't have that gift. Many of you do. Many of you may have it and are sitting in the pew rather than sitting and singing in the choir. God has called you to use your gift. Use it in a way that glorifies him, not 
like yourself or myself. I feel like God has given me the, the gift of teaching. Not in a, a haughty way by any stretch, but this is something that God has given to me that is different from you. You may not be equipped as a teacher, but God has still called you to use your gift. You may have the gift of serving and loving in our children's ministry or in our nursery. I learned very early in this church, whenever I was a college kid, before I was on staff, before I started transitioning to be pastor, I learned very early on I am not personally built or gifted to serve in children's church. Your deem, I mean children, um, <laughs> they, they are, they're not mine. My form of discipline is duct tape and a chair. And I couldn't do that. I haven't, just to be clear, because if I did, I probably would not be pastor here. I would be in jail somewhere for abuse and negligence or any other charges that they would get against me. That is not my gifting, but that is some of yours. The question is, are you using your gift? There are so many ministries that we as a church could do. There are so many ministries that other churches could do if the members would just start operating in their gifts. What God has given to you is different than what God has given to me or the person sitting next to you. What God has given for you is for building up the church. We are gifted for one another. Are you using your gift? Any of you all ever seen the movie Hidden Figures? It's an older movie now. I say older. It's six, seven years old now. But it tracks three African-American women that were in the early space program. One of these women went on to help track the trajectory for the Apollo 11 mission. Some of you were alive for the Apollo 11 mission and remember it well, where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon and said the famous line in July 20th, 1969, one small step for a man and one giant leap for mankind. The premise of the Hidden Figures movie and the Apollo 11 mission is that there were a thousand maybe more people working on this mission. Each one of them had different giftings. Each one of them were a specific focus. There were over a million parts on the Apollo 11 space shuttle. And if one of those parts failed, it would be mission failure. The same should be true of the church today. Every single one of us have a different gifting. And yet so many times churches are operating where people sitting in the pews are not operating in their giftedness at all. They're just sitting in the pews. And I would challenge you, if you are not doing anything here at this church, get involved. God has given you a gift that is so unique. If you don't know your giftedness, we'll put you somewhere. You may learn, like me, that your giftedness is not children's ministry. You may learn very quickly that your giftedness is not singing. But there are places for you to serve. There are places for you to get plugged in. There are things that are on, on, available for you, whether it's the media team that we're needing people to jump in on right now, whether it's the trunk or treat and all you've got to do is just decorate a, a trunk and be ready to pass out candy, whether it's coming and being able to greet people, whether it's cooking chili. There are so many things that are going on in the church for us to be able to operate in our giftedness that God has given to you and I. Do not be a casual attender. Be a committed follower. Be committed to the church. Commit to the community that we have here. Get to know one another. The third one another that we see this morning is that we should love and care for one another. We should love and care for one another. Verses 9 and 10 say this. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. The love in verse 9 is the Greek word agape. This love is an unselfish and unconditional kind of love. An agape love is an unconditional and unselfish love. Selfless love that God has loved for us. That even when we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is the selfless, unconditional kind of love that Paul is talking about that should permeate the church. We are called to love one another even when we disagree. We're called to love one another even when our feelings get hurt. We're called to love one another even when someone talks bad about us or our spouse. 
Let me make sure I make a connection here. Because if our identity is found in what we do or what people say about us, it is so easy for us to get our feelings hurt. It is so easy for me, if I am not careful, if my identity is found in my preaching ability or making sure that I can keep everyone in the church happy, it is very easy, if my identity is found that way, for me to get in my head, for me to get depressed, for me to just get angry and bitter. Now, I love every single one of you. I love the feedback that often you give to me. But my identity, whether I wake up or not on Monday morning, is not found in whether I satisfied you in the preaching or the jokes that I tell on Sunday morning. That frees me up to be able to proclaim God's word. That frees me up to be able to continue to move on even when we disagree. Even when there's friction in the family of God. There is freedom in my identity not being found in what I do. In the freedom that you can find in not being tied into what somebody says about you. This love that is unconditional and selfless allows for you and I to be so kind of different. To have a different kind of koinonia, community, with each other. Because even when we disagree about politics or even when we disagree about preferences, we can still come together and understand that we are moving forward. That it is Christ that unites us. Not only should we have agape love for those that are in the church, that unconditional, selfless love. But Paul says in verse 10 that the love should also be, he uses another kind of word, phileo. This is that brotherly affection. This is where Philadelphia gets its name from, the city of brotherly affection. It's from the Greek word phileo. This brotherly affection is a kind of love that is like a family. This is why we call the church a church family. It is because of this word here. It's a brotherly love that bonds you and I together as family members. When we see the church as family members, we stop hurting We stop struggling with our own selves and we look at the body of the believers that is here. We see them as our family members because it calls for us to come aside each other as our own family. It motivates us also to honor one another. Honor the elderly like your own mom or your own dad or your own grandparent. Honor those that are next to you like your brother and sister. Absolutely, yes, you may fight. You will go to war for each other too. I can talk bad about my brother, but you better not, right? Some of you have those relationships, too, with your family. It should be the same in our church. And yet so often churches tear each other down. Those tongues cut sharp. Our teeth bite and devour one another rather than proclaiming the gospel, rather than being united around each other. So often we attack one another. This is why Paul says in Ephesians 4, 29, he says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Does what you say toward people, and especially those in the church, do what you say build up those around you, or does it tear people down? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. It is so easy for you and I to default to a negative tone when talking about people. Let us build up each other. It may be the worst solo that you have ever heard in your life, but man, they praise God. Lift them up, encourage them, honor them. Your child may have a dirty diaper after today, and it may frustrate you, but they were serving. Lift them up, encourage them, thank them. Those that are sitting beside you or around you, those that you don't know, come alongside of them, encourage them. Hey, I haven't seen you here in a while. I've been missing you. Those that are normally here that aren't here today, call and check on them. Lift each other up. Honor each other. We are a church family. You call your mom, you call your brother when they're not feeling well. The same should be true of the kind of community that is in the church. What would the world look like if we stopped spending so much time tearing people down and instead we encouraged everyone that was around us? Like I talked about last week, encourage, be thankful, lift each other up, stir each other on. Who have you built up and encouraged today? Maybe it's a chance for you to do that before you leave today. So we belong to one another. We are gifted for one another. We love and care for one another. Fourth one is that we should pray for one another. Paul says in verse 12, 
rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. We are called to pray for those in the church, outside of your immediate family. Outside of your immediate family, who in this church are you praying for? It's a call and a challenge for all of us because we're family here. Who are you praying for that is not the person that you're sitting next to right now? Are you aware of the needs that are going on right now in our family? Are you aware of the struggles that are going on? And I'll poke fun at this a little bit, but prayer lists, often churches have come up with prayer lists, the ways to allow people to keep up with what's going on in the church, to encourage one another to pray for each other. And all of a sudden, Aunt Eunice gets on that prayer list, and Aunt Eunice has been dead for seven years, but nobody knows any better. And so she stays on the prayer list. Aunt Gertrude, I always make fun of old ladies, I don't know why, they have good fun names. Aunt Gertrude's gout, she's always got her gout. You pray for Aunt Gertrude. And all of a sudden, the prayer list on the church, remember the back of the bulletin, we used to keep it on the back of bulletins, and the font got to be like 2.5 to squeeze in all the Gertrudes and the Billies and the Johns. We're not really sure. Oh, whew, a whole column of unspokens. Can't forget those. To make fun of those things, yes, but... Who in the church outside of your family are you praying for? Are you aware of the needs that are going on in our church family? Outside of your immediate family members, who is praying for you? Who are you praying for and who is praying for you? This is why we have connection cards available for each of you. For our body of believers to come together. It's impossible for Rick or I or any of the other staff members or the deacons to help pray alongside of you if we're unaware of what's going on in your lives. There are hundreds of people that come in and out every single week. It is almost impossible to keep up with everything that is going on. And it's not just the duty of the staff members to pray for you. What we do at the church, we share with our deacons so that our deacons can contact you as a family when you are struggling and going through things. This is our charge and our duty to our deacons here because they're supposed to help take care of families. But who also that you can know, are connected with, that you can say right now, that you can contact to pray for you? This leads us to the last one another this morning, is that we are called to bear with one another. We're called to bear with one another. Verse, verses 15 through 18 say this. Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony. Be wise. Oh, sorry. Skip the line there. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Biblical community rejoices with those who are rejoicing and weeps with those who are weeping. This is bearing with one another. Another question for you. Outside of your own family, who at this church can you call when you need somebody to rejoice with you or to weep with you? Outside of your family, who in this church can you call? I'm not saying all of us should have those people automatically. Maybe you're newer to the church and you're just trying to learn somebody. Maybe you are visiting and you don't have any of those yet. But if you've been coming here for a year, two years, three years, and you don't have anybody that you can call on and rejoice or weep with, I would encourage you to get plugged in, get deeper in the church. There are Sunday school classes and Wednesday night. There are things that I want to do moving forward in the future to get us to connect with each other more. And those things will come in time. We're called to bear with one another as family members in unconditional love. Who in this church are you able to partner alongside of? Biblical community calls for you and I to have a deeper level of meaningful relationships that bear with one another through the highs and lows of life. Paul writes about this also in Galatians chapter 6. Paul says, bear with one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. 
But let each one of you test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. There's a difference here that Paul is highlighting between a load and a burden. A load is something that you carry every single day. Every single one of us have unique loads that you are bearing. My load as a father of one, soon to be two, is different than a mother or father of four. Or even from a mother or father of two, and one has special needs, one has diabetes, whatever those things may be, our loads are different. Those are for me to bear and for Amy to bear. Those are for you to bear as an individual. Those are individual loads that you are called to bear. And so often, whenever we ask about our days, whenever we ask about, hey, how's your week going? So often we share about our loads, like me. When I was talking about early, and Lorelai's been a demon child all week. You can't help in that. You're not there for the four hours yesterday she was screaming her head off. It was by the grace of God that somehow we did not hurt her. You're not there for that. That's not your responsibility. That's my load. That's Amy's load. And often, whenever we share about our weeks, how easy is it to minimize what somebody's load is? Oh, we just wait until they're a teenager. You're absolutely right. One day we will face that. But right now, our load is difficult. Don't minimize what's going on in somebody's life because their load may be hard and difficult for them right now. Because if you minimize other people's loads, it's more difficult to share burdens because we think that people are going to minimize those things as well. A load is something that you and I carry out every single day in our lives. And if we're not careful, we will stay so superficial with people because we won't want to encourage, we want to share about what's going on in our life. We'll just give them the cursory, well, my week was good or it was okay. And we won't want to go any deeper than that. This is not bearing with one another, even if somebody else can't help carry you the load. We are called to encourage and to lift up those that are in the family. We've talked about this. Our load is our own. A burden is a crisis, something that overwhelms the load that we are already carrying. Perhaps you've had the flu or COVID, and you need somebody to help take your kids to school. You need somebody to pick up groceries for you. You need somebody to do something. That's a burden, something that comes on top of the load that you are already carrying. And church, can we just be honest? Just you and me. How hard is it to share our burdens with one another? Especially in our deep south rooted tradition where we like to keep everything private. How hard is it to share our burdens with those around us? Maybe it's because we don't have a biblical community people that we can call and trust on. Maybe it is only your family. Praise God that you have family that can help you out in those situations. But the koinonia fellowship that God has called us to is supposed to be here in the church. It's supposed to be here in the church because in Paul's day, whenever he's writing these words, whenever he's talking about this kind of community, often when you came to know Jesus, your own family separated from you. They disowned you. You didn't have the ability for your family to come alongside and bear the burden of you losing your job because you identify as a Christian. You getting cut off from everything because your parents disown you. But here in our modern day American culture, so many of us become so self-absorbed and self-centered. We don't want to burden anybody else. This is why it's a burden. You're called to bear with one another. You're called to share and come alongside all of those things. These crises that come up that many of you are walking through right now. I can call out names, I can call out situations, knowing what is going on in our church family. The question is, do you know those things? Are you coming alongside those that are in the church? Are you able to bear with one another here in the church? That is a responsibility of the individual to share their burden, and that's a responsibility of the church to come alongside as well. Are you carrying a load Or are you carrying a burden? Because right now, if you are carrying a burden, Jesus has called you to come to him. Because he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will find rest in me. 
Some of you right now may need to share your burdens in the church. Some of you right now may need to pray about your burdens that you are going through because the crisis right now is overwhelming. Maybe some of you need to pray about those in the church that you can partner with, to come alongside, to share burdens with, to take a meal to them, to pray for them. There are so many things going on in every single one of our lives. And the question is, are you trying to carry it on your own? Or do you just need to lay it at the feet of Jesus? The community that God has called us to as a healthy church, the community that God has called you to be able to participate in, is not found in yourself. It is found in the church. It is found in Jesus. It is found in committing your life to him. The question is, have you? Have you shared with others? Have you trusted in Christ? Will you stand with me? God, we praise you. God, every single one of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. Called and uniquely gifted to be able to carry the burden, the load that is in our lives. God, but you have not called us to carry our own burdens. You have called us to share with those around you. You have called for us to trust and depend and lean on you. And God, I pray for us in the church. Maybe we are aware of those things and we just don't want to impose ourselves on somebody. We need to reach out. We need to talk to them because, God, they just may need a text or a phone call. They just may need a meal. They just may need a word of encouragement. God, I pray that you would call us to partner and bear with one another, love one another, pray for one another. God, there are so many one another's in the, in the scripture that calls for the church to be a body. And God, I pray that we will be one, united in focus, united in goal, and God willing to share with one another. It is in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.